It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the AOC AG254FG. The OSD can be controlled by a joystick at the rear of the monitor, towards the right side, as viewed from the front. Or alternatively, using the included quick switch remote. You've got 1, 2 and 3 there, which allows you to quickly activate the Gamer 1, Gamer 2 and Gamer 3 presets. Directional, just like the joystick. OK or Enter and a back button. There are a few quirks to be aware of with the menu system and they're all covered in the calibration section of the written review. As noted there, they may not apply to all units. It might be that I just had quite an early sample. My one's from August 2021. They might have fixed it since then. I have made them aware of it. So they'll hopefully look into any issues that are still unresolved. Just one thing I noticed, if you use the joystick to increase something like brightness, which is called peak white nits on this monitor. If you use the joystick, you can just hold it and it will just quickly go up like that. If instead you're using the quick switch and you hold the button down, it just stops. So it only gives you one key press and you have to keep pressing it. So it takes ages to adjust something like brightness using the quick switch remote. If you press the joystick up or the quick switch up before entering the main menu system, you can cycle the input or select the input used by the monitor. If you press the quick switch to the left, you can select one of the game modes, and I'll go through this when I get to them in the main menu system. If you press down, you get this little crosshair on the screen. You can't change the position of the crosshair, and you can't change the color or the size or anything like that. It's just the design shown. But if you see that on the screen and you don't want it there, just press down with the quick switch or the joystick, and it will disappear. If you hold the joystick in for a few seconds, that's how you power the monitor off. You can't do this with the quick switch. So I'm now going to show you the light effects feature. And you can find that in the main menu system with the light effects section. If you just press the joystick right, there are a few options here. So for the more complete options, you can change the strength of the light effects feature, low, medium and strong. And the feature itself, so it has a strip of LEDs beneath the bottom bezel, and it also has some cheeks either side of the screen, and you control them together. So you can't independently control the different LEDs. It's all controlled as one individual thing. So it has a few different modes. I'm not going to go through all of these. It'll take ages, but this is static. So it's just on all the time. Dark point sweep. Various others, as you can see here. Rainbow. I might as well show you that one. That one's a little bit more exciting, I suppose. So it just cycles various different colors. And you can also see a little bit of a glow around the monitor from the front. This is a dark room, but even then it doesn't really do an awful lot, to be honest. It's quite a weak glow. So you can just about see it. I'm not sure if you can actually see it in the video. I might have to move the camera a little bit so you can see behind. So it's only a weak glow, very difficult to see from the front. And the camera basically just blanks it out because it's so weak compared to the light from the monitor itself. A few others, wave, flashing, and demo. So demo just cycles various different light effects modes. And with some of them, such as zoom, you can see that there are foreground and background colors, which you can change. But in terms of customizing the color, you get full RGB control. So I've got it set to 100 a piece at the moment. That's the brightest the LEDs will go. So I've got it set to light effects strong, 100 each channel. So this gives a cool bluish white which is as strong as it'll go, but even then, there's not really much of a glow around the monitor. But you have complete customization of the color in that you can adjust the channels to your liking. And just a reminder, if you use the little quick function here, you can set how strong the light effects feature is, you can set the mode, and you can set the pattern. So you can have user define, which you'd have to define in the menu, as I was showing you just before. We've got red, green, and blue as presets. G menu, you can use this to control the light effects feature. When you're using the light effects on the with G menu, you do have to have the USB cable connected, and this is all you can do with G menu, so it's super restrictive. None of this does anything, by the way. This is completely ignored by the monitor, and that's because it has a G-Sync module, so you can't access it in the way you usually could and change things like this. But you can select light effects sync. Also, if you just select light effects, it doesn't let you do anything. You probably can't see this in the video, but it's not changing the LEDs at all. If you select light effects sync, you can change the red, green, and blue. 
channels manually here and you can see there are 255 shade levels for each channel. You can also select one of the presets or select the color with the little gradient thing there. And different modes there, static breathing or blink you can change the pulsation, how quickly it pulses, if it's that kind of setting rather than static. And you can also select the brightness. Just be aware that if you then click apply after you've set this up, the G-Menu will completely take control, even if you've closed G-Menu. That means that if you try and change light effects in the OSD, it will completely ignore it. It will just completely ignore what you're doing. You can't even disable it if you had enabled it with G-Menu. And that's quite annoying. Even if you turn the monitor off or holding the joystick in, it will completely ignore it. And you'll have to use the application to control it. The only way to overcome that seems to be to disconnect the power from the monitor, wait 10 seconds or so, perhaps a bit longer, reconnect the power, and then you can regain light effects control with the OSD. And since I'm showing you the lighting features at the moment, I might as well show you the other lighting features. So if you go into game setting, quick switch LED, that just gives you a little red ring around the quick switch remote. And if you go to extra, there's also logo projector, which you can set to strong, medium, or weak, or you can have it off if you prefer. You also have control over the red, green, and blue channel values for this. So I've got it set to 100 apiece again, which is the brightest it'll go. And you can actually see it's so bright that it has a little bit of a rainbow fringe. You might be able to see various different colors. Kind of pretty. There's also a little switch at the top of the projector element itself. And that switches to an alternative logo. Sorry, the cable's in the way. This often happens, actually. The cable can get in the way of the logo. If you were using the cable tidy, like a good person, a little cable tidy down there, it would stop that happening. And I'm going to go through the main menu system. So there's game setting first. You can change the game mode, the presets used by the monitor. So the numbered ones here, Gamer 1, Gamer 2, Gamer 3, fully customizable. If you set it off, it's also fully customizable. So this just really lets you have different sets of settings which you can use. And you can also use the quick switch, as I mentioned earlier, to quickly cycle between Gamer 1, Gamer 2, and Gamer 3. The other presets, I wouldn't bother using them to be honest, they just make various preset adjustments. They also lock off your control to various things. So the FPS mode, for example, you can't access the shadow control feature. You can't access overdrive either, that's locked into weak, which as it happens is the optimal mode to use in my opinion anyway. You can't access the luminance either, so you can't even change the brightness of the screen and you can't change the color channels. So it makes a few preset adjustments and it seems to raise the gamma quite a bit. So the reason it will be doing that, well, I was gonna say, it seems to raise the gamma a bit. I think it might just be that it's a much brighter than I was looking at before and my eyes haven't adjusted properly, but it appears that the gamma is raised a bit, but not as much as I was expecting. So the first few blocks there are blended. I would expect an FPS mode would show these all very clearly to give you an advantage when you're looking at enemies in dark areas, making them easy to spot, but the FPS mode doesn't do that. There's RTS, which makes further adjustments and blocks things off in exactly the same way. Racing, again, just blocks things off. G-Sync Esports, this is one you'd use if you want a competitive edge, I suppose. So this makes different adjustments. You can actually see that shadow control is set to three, which is the maximum value, and I'll show you the shadow control separately shortly. And again, you can't change the luminance, you can't access the luminance menu, and you can't access color setup. If I go back to Legom, legom.nl, the website, I can see that the blocks are more visible. Might not come across on the camera quite as I see it, but I can see all of the blocks. Definitely is designed for a competitive edge, but it really gives quite a washed out look to the image. Next, you've got shadow control. You can set that to zero, which is disabled. One, two, or three. Three is the strongest effect. And I'll go back on to Legom. Shouldn't have really bothered going off. So with it set to three, it makes these blocks more visible. So you can see the effect of shadow control there. It raises these dark shades up. It's designed to improve visibility in dark areas to give you a competitive edge. Even with it set to three, it isn't extreme with its enhancement. So blocks one and two aren't super distinct, but also be aware that it doesn't raise the black point, so it doesn't affect your contrast. So it's more selective. In that respect. If you go to luminance and then change your relative gamma to minus 0.4, that will give you 
sort of an extreme boost in terms of making dark shades much lighter than they should be, so that's something you could do. This doesn't come across perfectly on the video. The first few blocks look more blended than they do to my eye, but you get the idea. Next you've got Dial Point, which is the name they give to that little crosshair I showed you before. Quick Switch LED, which I showed you before, that's the little ring around the Quick Switch controller. Overdrive, that can be set to off, strong, medium or weak. Weak is optimal, as I explore in the review. There's a frame counter feature, and you can have this set to right up, right down, left down or left up, depending on which corner of the screen you want it at. You can see it says 360 hertz. This will change if you're using G-Sync. You can see it's fluctuating at the moment, as my frame rate is also fluctuating. NVIDIA Pendulum demo. If you're using FreeSync, so using Adaptive Sync, the monitor, this seems to just stay at 360 hertz or whatever you have set as your static refresh rate rather than changing. But you can use FreeSync with this monitor via DisplayPort as I explore in the review. But you should also be able to see the lack of tearing or stuttering, so you can tell it's working that way. But it is a shame that the frame counter feature doesn't work like it does with G-Sync. Next you've got luminance, you can set the contrast. You can set the brightness, which is called peak white nits on this, and you can set that between, I'm going to have to reach for the joystick here because I can't do this with the quick switch controller, 40 and 450. This isn't going to be exactly what the luminance of the monitor is. For example, it doesn't update this value if you change other settings which would affect your luminance, such as the colour channels. But if you look at the measurements I gave in the written review in the contrast and brightness section in the table there, you'll see that they're not too far off actually, just in general, so it gives you a good guide. It's quite a nice way of displaying brightness on a monitor, I feel, and it gives you very good flexibility. There's variable backlight mode. That's just a dynamic contrast setting. It's greyed out at the moment because I'd need to have SDR variable backlight enabled, or I'd have to be running an HDR, and I'll show you that very shortly. This is just a dynamic contrast setting. It's all explored in the review. Gaming, hybrid, or desktop, if you want to use that. Relative gamma, which I showed you just before. You can set that to minus 0.4, minus 0.2, the default, plus 0.2, or plus 0.4. And on my unit, these did correspond to the actual measured gamma, so it gives you an offset, as it says there, if you want to do that. SDR colours sRGB, this does absolutely nothing on this monitor. This would be an sRGB emulation setting or a gamut clamp on wide gamut monitors, but this is a standard gamut monitor and this doesn't do anything at all. You'll see HDR variable backlight. I'm just going to switch over to HDR and show you how the settings change under HDR. So I'm just going to enable HDR in Windows with a little toggle. And now you'll see a lot of this is greyed out. I can't change the brightness. It says ref white nits. That says 80, but it's not actually 80. It's just completely greyed out. You can't adjust that. You can change the variable backlight mode, gaming, hybrid, or desktop. Or if you want to disable that, you can do that with the HDR variable backlight setting. That's really the only control you have. You can change the preset, but basically the way they've done HDR on this it means you can access the colour channels, which usually you can't do. So you can change the colour temperature or you can manually adjust the red, green and blue colour channels, even under HDR. I'd recommend not being too extreme with the adjustments here. Usually you wouldn't be able to adjust this under HDR, but if you want to get rid of a slight tint or you want to change things a little bit there, you could even use a low blue light setting with HDR, then you can do that. I would say that it's not going to really, HDR is supposed to look at specific metadata and follow that closely and it'll be going against that if you make too many adjustments here, but really the HDR on this monitor isn't anywhere near true HDR anyway, so you can do what you want to be honest. There's an auto brightness feature that uses a light sensor on the monitor and it adjusts according to the ambient lighting. You can also adjust the peak white nits and that really just acts as a brightness limiter. Even if I set this to 450, which is the maximum though, I find the screen often too dim with this setting, so I don't know, they've tuned it very strangely to be honest. I don't find it useful for that reason. Some people might, some people might find it works for them, but the adjustments it makes, they find it agreeable, that's fine, but for me it doesn't work. Max brightness, this is such a weird setting, but all this does, if you turn it on, it increases the default peak white nits to 200, unless I've changed that, I think it is 200. I say in the written review exactly what it is, and it also enables the logo projector. That is all it does, it doesn't do anything else, it doesn't unlock a high brightness or anything like that, as you might expect it would do, so really odd setting. Next you've got G-Sync Processor, the exciting bit. 
It's a deep sleep setting, not so exciting. If you send your system to sleep and you're finding that the monitor isn't waking up properly, this setting may be to blame if you've got this set to on. If you have this set to on otherwise and you don't send your computer to sleep much or you're not having issues with it, just leave it on, that's fine. It will slightly reduce the standby power consumption of the monitor. USB charge if you want to charge with the USB ports. If you have this set to on, even if you're not actively charging or not even using the USB ports, it will increase the power consumption of the monitor slightly, which is why it's set to off by default. Next, there's NVIDIA Reflex Latency Analyzer. So this monitor has a dedicated Reflex Analyzer port or Reflex port. It's the green colored USB port. You need to be using a compatible mouse. So AOC has kind of given me this one. This is the, I'm not really a mouse person, so I have to look it up at the bottom of the mouse. This is apparently the GM510B. So they've just kindly gifted me this for the purposes of the review so I can test the reflex latency analyzer feature. And that's what I'm gonna be doing now. So if I press this, you select on. It then puts a little reading up there in milliseconds. The idea here is that you're in a game. You don't have to be in a game to do this, but it's really designed to look at your muzzle flashes in a game. That's sort of the standard thing you'd be doing with this. You'll see that it puts a box in the middle of the screen and that's where it's gonna be monitoring for your muzzle flash. More specifically, what it's monitoring is a sudden change in brightness. It is an end-to-end -end system latency analyzer. So it analyzes the latency between you pressing the mouse and all the processing done by the system and anything that the game engine's doing whilst it's drawing the muzzle flash and also the latency of the monitor itself, the input lag. So don't confuse these readings with just the input lag of the monitor. That is not something which this can break down for you and show you individually as we do in our reviews. This is a end-to-end -end system latency, the full latency of the system and the monitor, everything that's going on after you press the mouse button or click to photon as some people like to call it. So anyway, I'll fire up a game, Battlefield 5. So you'll also see, hopefully you can see in the video, towards the top right it says 360 FPS, so it's showing you the frame rate of the game. And this is going to give me the lowest latency. It's not an exact reading there, so it will fluctuate a bit. This is an origin counter. It's not the monitor's display or anything like that. So you might see a little bit of fluctuation, but it's supposed to be running at 360 frames a second. So that will minimize the latency in that respect. And if I click the mouse now, you'll see it gives me a reading, 20.1 milliseconds. And it's looking at the muzzle flash, or it should be looking at the muzzle flash. What I was saying about the animations though is that it is just looking at a brightness change, a sudden brightness change. So if there's a ricochet on the wall, it might actually be seeing that. You can play around with it a bit. So if you're finding it's giving you odd readings or really inconsistent readings, you can change the preset to right-handed or left-handed for the rectangle. And that's just depends on how your character is holding the weapon really. Or you can change the location manually. So you can have it a little bit higher a little bit lower, depending on how the game is drawing the muzzle flash or which area you want to be looking at. And you can also change the rectangle size. So that's more specifically the width of the rectangle. The monitoring sensitivity you could change that as well if you're finding it's not working properly. Low, medium or high. I find it fine set to the default of medium. If it's not displaying the rectangle because you had the rectangle off, it'll just use the default and it will still give you readings. It will still look at that rectangle. The monitor will still analyze the latency there. So I've noticed it's pretty inconsistent, but I think that's really this game. Um, the game engine itself is perhaps not the best for this kind of thing. And also the muzzle flashes are sort of complex animations on this, and there's a lot more going on. So see, I just got 18.7 milliseconds there, 15.6, 20.9, 28 28.3. So there is some variation. And I think this will probably work better on games with simple muzzle flash animations and very direct, quick muzzle flash animations. This game has a bit more going on, to be honest. So it's, so you will see there's quite a bit of variation. But if you have a game where this is working quite consistently, that's nice. What can you actually do with the figures? Well, that's a good question, to be honest. Some people will see this as a bit of a gimmick. Other people will say it, see it as a bit of a cool feature. I actually ran a poll on Twitter and most people did seem to see it as a cool feature, although they hadn't actually used it themselves. And there were a fair few that did just see it as a gimmick. Also, if you want to see a more complex breakdown, you can use GeForce Experience. That won't be able to show you the latency of the monitor itself, 
but it will give you the monitor and system latency and it can also give you the mouse latency separately and you could rerun this with different settings changed in the game to try and get an idea of how they might be affecting your latency or you might want to run it at different frame rates to see how that would affect things as well so i do see some utility in that respect and there are some games that are sort of reflex latency enabled, I think they call them. But there's an article exploring all of this on NVIDIA's website, and I'll link to that in the description of the video. Just be aware that you do need a compatible NVIDIA GPU. You also need a compatible reflex mouse. Although, as the NVIDIA article notes, you can get away with using a different mouse that isn't reflex compatible. NVIDIA does have a database which has the latency readings for various common mice as they call them. So it might be that your mouse isn't reflex compatible, but it's still in NVIDIA's database, so it can work out the latency of that or what, what should be the latency of that. And you can still get readings with reflex latency analyzer, which could be useful. The other setting here is ULMB, ultra low motion blur. To use that, you need to have the monitor set to either 144 Hertz or 240 Hertz, and you also have to have G-Sync disabled. So I'm about to enable this at 240 Hertz. I've also disabled G-Sync. So be aware that you might see some flickering on the screen if you're sensitive to that kind of thing. I think actually the camera's filtered it out very well. The video has filtered it out very well or something's filtered it out very well, but it is in fact using ULMB. And yes, I can see that to my eye as well. So ULMB pulse width, that's basically your brightness setting or the main brightness setting you should be using when using ULMB. And that's all explored in the written review. This changes the duration of the on phase of the pulse. So if this is higher, it's relatively bright. If it's lower, it could potentially improve the motion clarity. But I do explore this in the written review in some detail. And the pulse widths can be set between 10 and 100. Next, you've got color setup. It's a low blue mode setting and that's explored in the written review. This is really not a very effective low blue light setting. Even if you set this to reading, which is the strongest mode, it will give a bit of a warmer look to things. It will reduce the blue color channel somewhat, but it isn't as effective as I'd like to see from a low blue light setting. So I wouldn't rely on this if you're trying to improve your sleep and make sure that the monitor isn't affecting your melatonin production, your sleep hormones. I actually use this because it's very simple to use. I usually do use low blue light settings on monitors if one's available, but there's a night light setting in Windows 11 and Windows 10, which you can enable. You can even have it set to a schedule if you prefer, and that does do the trick for me and it should do the trick for you. It isn't as good as a low blue light setting you can use on a monitor in the sense that it does affect the color output more and it has more of an effect in terms of reducing your shade variety and can give you a bit of banding in places, that kind of thing. But honestly, the, the main thing you're gonna be wanting to use this for is really viewing comfort and it should work for you anyway. There's DP and HDMI, YCB, CR, sRGB. This just changes the gamma behavior of the monitor if you are feeding it a YCB, CR signal. So if you're using a full range RGB signal, which most people will be doing and should be doing, this isn't gonna have any impact whatsoever. It's just if you're using a YCBCR signal. Six axis color that allows you to change the color channels, red, green, blue, cyan, yellow, and magenta. So there's good control there. And they're set to 127 by default, just in case you fiddled with them and you were wondering what the default value is. Color temp that can be set to normal, warm, user, or cool. The user setting allows you to change the red, green, and blue color channels manually. So this is an alternative to setting them here. You can make adjustments with both controls if you wish to supremely fine-tune things, but most people should be actually fine just using these red, green, and blue controls here. Next up, you've got audio, and this allows you to change the volume of the integrated speakers or anything connected to the 3.5mm jack if you're using that, and you can also enable or disable DTS sound. This just makes the sound a little bit fuller, a little bit richer. I find it really quite um, I don't know, bass heavy and sort of compressed together with DTS sound off. So I prefer having it set on. Personal preferences may vary. I do talk a little bit about the speakers of this one in the written review. There's light effects, which I've already gone through. Extra, there's input auto switch if you want the monitor to automatically switch the input, or you can have that disabled if you want to make sure you're selecting the input yourself. And you can select that here, or you can as I showed you earlier, just press the joystick up or up on the S switch. The logo projector, which I've shown you, reset, which will reset everything to the factory defaults. There's an information section, which has some information about the current resolution, refresh rate, whether NVIDIA G-Sync is being used, the pixel format, 
and a few other things as well. Finally, there's OSD setup, so you can change the language that the OSD is displayed in. There's a timeout period, so that's how long after the last button press before the OSD will automatically disappear. I should have set this a little bit high before the video, but you can set that to 120 seconds if you prefer. Or you can just press the back button a few times to get rid of the OSD manually. You can change the horizontal and vertical position of the OSD. There's a transparency effect. You can increase or decrease that. There's a break reminder feature, and that will just give you a little message on the screen after an hour to remind you to take a break. So that's really all there is to the OSD on-screen display menu system of AOC AG254FG. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.